inventing TV Be Gone, a keychain that turns off TVs in public places. He co-founded a successful Silicon Valley startup and did pioneering work in virtual reality. He is an author and teacher and goes around the world giving talks and workshops. Mitch promotes hackerspaces, open, space, open source hardware, and mentors others wherever he goes. He is a co-founder of Noisebridge Hackerspace in San Francisco and is president and CEO of Cornfield Electronics. Leslie Berlin is project historian for the Silicon Valley Archives at Stanford University. She contributed to the monthly <coughs> prototype column on innovation to the Sunday business section of the New York Times and has commented on Silicon Valley for National Public Radio, PBS, The Atlantic, Wired, and other media. Her book, Troublemakers, explores how Silicon Valley during the 1970s set the stage for our modern high-tech world, and her book, The Man Behind the Microchip, was deemed required reading for today's entrepreneurs and executives by the Washington Post. Leslie has been a fellow at the Center for Advanced Studies in the Behavioral Sciences and served on the advisory committee to the Lemelson Center for the Study of Invention and Innovation at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. She received her PhD in History from Stanford and her BA in American Studies from Yale. And now join me in welcoming Mitch and Leslie. <laughs> now we are. Yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. Yeah, we're both excited to be here. We uh, met each other for the first time over the phone not too long ago and immediately hit it off. So this is going to be a great conversation. Yeah. And we uh, came up with a little outline, and we thought the way we would begin was each of us talking for about five minutes and then talking uh, to each other. And did they say you were starting or am I starting? Uh, you get to start. I get to start. Okay. Uh, so I've actually been studying uh, Silicon Valley's history uh, since uh, 1993 when mm -hmm. I moved out uh, to Palo Alto from mm -hmm. Oklahoma, which is where I grew up, uh, to get my PhD at Stanford. And what's always really drawn me to the history of Silicon Valley really even though what we hear about is uh, the business and the technology, and I'm very interested in both of those, what has always grabbed me are the stories and the people and the questions of, uh, sort of culture and ideas and ideals and where people get their inspiration and their motivation. Uh, it's always been to me in super intriguing and to overlap that with something like technology, which I think up until very, very recently has been grossly underappreciated as a huge factor in American history, has that's been really exciting. Um, so to me, it's been about narrative underpinned with facts <laughs> um, and technology and business. And so I'm, I'm really excited to talk uh, tonight about the counterculture and other influences um, in making Silicon Valley happen and what is going on now that is keeping it going and raising real questions about it. Yeah, so um, well, I, was, I was born uh, a total geek and um, introverted. I loved staying at home and um, just working on projects. Um, and even though, though my brother was uh, in the bunk bed underneath me, I built an intercom so we could talk to each other. <laughs> I'm that kind of geeks. And, um, but uh, my mom was a teacher and uh, she taught learning disability kids. And from a young age, I started helping by showing these kids some of the things that I made and showing them that they could make it as well. And it was really wonderful. These kids often had no sense of achievement in their life at all. And just by showing a few simple things, they suddenly could um, have this confidence that they could do things they didn't know they could do. And um, so anyways, I, I, um, 
uh, did lots of things, but I, I ended up being in Silicon Valley for the first time in 1986, which was quite a long time ago. Um, Leslie wrote a book that brings history up to 1980, full of different stories of people, and uh, I have a bunch of stories starting in 86, a little bit of gap. But uh, I went there after I quit a job that I hated in out east in Boston, and um, I was working full time and I hated that too. I came to San Francisco and uh, met some freak at an electronic music show not too far from here, uh, South Market, and he hired me on the spot, working part-time, helping uh, with a little computer uh, controller for input device for a visual programming language, which we never got going because we were using technology of 86 and it required the technology of 1990. And uh, we didn't know that, but uh, what we ended up doing is making these input devices and output devices intended for the uh, programming language into what we called alternate reality generators. And it was impossible to tell anyone who wasn't a total geek what the hell that meant. So uh, Jaron Lanier, the person whose company it was, uh, called it virtual reality, because that's what we created without really even knowing what the hell we were doing. Um, but this is the kind of place Silicon Valley was back then, and in many ways it still is. A bunch of freaks getting together, just exploring and trying things. Whether it worked or not wasn't the main thing. It was really fun to try it, learn from whatever didn't work, and then try again using whatever we did to do what's next. And um, this is the kind of culture that spawned um, you know, what, what we have today. And uh, for me, uh, I became a consultant for many years thereafter. And uh, I worked for all sorts of startups, almost all, no, 100% of which all failed. And uh, I thought, well, gee, you know, I'm working for all these companies that fail. I could start a company that fails just as easily on my own. So I did it. And, um, and uh, remarkably enough, it didn't fail. Uh, and it gave me enough money so that I could make the first 20,000 TV Be Gone remote controls, which is one of the things I'd been thinking about for about 10 years up till that point, and that was 2004, and for the last 13 years, me and 12 friends have made a living on this totally crazy project uh, that we love, uh, 14, uh, almost 14 years now. And um, so uh, that got me, doing TV Be Gone got me to give uh, interviews, lectures, talks, workshops all over the world, including hacker conferences, which I ended up going to and falling in love with, and learning about the hacker scene. And hacking in this case means not breaking into anyone's computers and stealing shit, but um, doing positive things, encouraging each other to explore and try things that are meaningful and sharing it with others, and learning from it, seeing what works, what doesn't, sharing with others. This is what we do at hacker conferences, and this is what we do at hacker spaces, which grew out of this scene. And I ended up co-founding an early hacker space in the United States called Noisebridge, which is in San Francisco. It's always open and always free. Please, anyone, come visit us. You're always welcome. And doing workshops there led me to going around the world giving uh, workshops at lots of hacker spaces around the world, which ended up growing lots of hacker spaces. And before you know it, the hacker space movement is all over the world, and there are thousands and thousands of them now. So I continue to do talks and workshops. I'm also mentoring. I'm also encouraging people to share what they know. And I love open hardware, open software. And I'm still teaching more and more at schools and universities all around the world with project-based learning and encouraging people to actually learn in a school, which I assume people do here, rather than just take tests. OK, so now I have a lot to say about that. Um, coincidentally, my mother also was a learning disabled, a teacher of learning disabled students. So Which there you we go. didn't mention. Another thing in common. Um, I just want to, to point out um, really how representative so much of your experience is. Because I mean, I, I love when I'm with someone who's actually done it, as opposed to me who just steps back and looks at all these people who've done this sort of thing before and then 
tries to uh, kind of discern patterns um, because what you're describing is so characteristic. A, people who are trying to do something for themselves, you know, the sense that, ah, I really wish this would exist and it doesn't exist and I'm gonna make it exist um, is a really big one. B, uh, your story about um, failure and how all these things you did failed. And I think there's sort of a fetishization of, of failure in Silicon Valley, too much, um, where people seem to think uh, that you know, it's, it's almost best to fail in Silicon Valley. Whereas if you talk to most people, they'll tell you, I would have preferred not to have failed, um, but I, you know, I did and here's what I learned from it. Uh, but I do think that's something really important and I think it's reflective um, not only of a certain level of tolerance, but honestly what it means to be um, an engineer or someone, a scientist, uh, a mathematician. You can't do that without failing. I mean, that tells you what your next step needs to be. And I think that has been deeply um, embedded in the culture. And a third thing that I wanted to point out is this sense of if that idiot can do this, I can do this. I mean, that is huge, the sort of idiot at the next bench over. Um, how many companies have been started for that reason? It's, re it's really um, very remarkable. And I think also um, what uh, you're describing as this desire to sort of give back um, with the hacker spaces, I think this is something that has really been a huge part of Silicon Valley culture for a very long time that is hard, I think, for people sometimes now to believe because the image of a Silicon Valley guy, because it's usually guys that people talk about, um, and, I, and I don't think this is a fair image, but it's the prevailing image, is it's sort of a, of a very self-centered person um, in it for himself. Um, whereas if you look back over time, a really important part of this culture has been a sense that you come up and then you turn around and you help somebody else come up. So uh, Bob Noyce, who was the guy who I wrote my first book about, he co-invented the microchip and co-founded Fairchild Semiconductor and Intel uh, and mentored Steve Jobs. Um, Bob Noyce was from Iowa and he called this restocking the stream I fished from. And Steve Jobs himself referred to this phenomenon uh, when he talked about um, when he gave his commencement address at Stanford in 2005, he talked about uh, when he was fired from Apple and how uh, he called up Noyce and he called up David Packard and apologized for what he called dropping the baton. He had had this sense of almost an intergenerational relay race where one generation helps the next one and hands off the baton. And um, Steve Jobs actually pass that baton forward. Um, Mark Zuckerberg considers him an important mentor. The founders of Google do as well. Um, and I think that it's um, an important part of Silicon Valley culture and one of its secrets to success that needs to be maintained. Um, and again, uh, when we're talking more about uh, the, the countercultural roots of the valley, this is part of that as well, this sense that you're trying uh, to kind of improve the net value of the world by helping other people do what you now know how to do. Um, and that's part of our uh, project also, I would just say at the Silicon Valley Archives at Stanford, which is where I work. Um, we have a huge collection of, you name it, business plans, lab notebooks, um, people's recollections, uh, old photos, old videos um, that are open to the public. and. Students come, anyone can come and use those and get a sense of, well, how did this happen? Um, how can I try to make this happen? So I do think this perpetuity is an important element of uh, what happens in the Valley when it happens right. Yeah, and um, one of the, the things, I, um, especially in China, but everywhere in the world uh, where I give talks, there are all these um, bureaucrats, uh, administrators that are wanting to copy Silicon Valley. And uh, unfortunately, the way they do that is they've seen pictures, they may never have been here, but they've seen pictures of buildings. And so they build buildings or fix up old buildings to look like what they think Silicon Valley buildings should look like. Down to the red roof tiles. I mean, you literally can see pseudo Stanford campuses all over the world. Yeah. 
And then they, they throw a bunch of money at it and they think that a whole bunch of startups will just magically appear there and that everyone will get rich. It doesn't work that way. That's called a cargo cult. A cargo cult uh, is uh, this, uh, in, in some South Pacific island, the, uh, some people uh, were stranded there in World War II and uh, some airlifts brought some supplies to them. The people who lived in this island thought that that was magic and they build uh, air, things that look like airplanes out of sticks and leaves and things and they think that magic will happen as a result. This is happening all over the world, um, this cargo cult thing for Silicon Valley. And um, it doesn't work that way. You know, why did this happen here of all the places in the world? Why didn't it happen in Chicago or New York or Paris? Why did it happen here? And in, in your, your book, you describe three main things. The thing I uh, focus uh, money and uh, culture and um, tech, technology. Tech, the technology that builds uh, on itself, standing on the, the shoulders of giants before. Uh, the thing that I always focus on um, and that uh, I think is uh, key for the way I look at it is the culture. San Francisco has always been the place since its inception in the gold rush where the weirdos of the country and the world collect. Total weirdos. People who look at things in their own way, who don't have a whole lot to lose and they have a lot to gain. And they come together in community and support each other and encourage each other to do whatever it is they do. And um, we definitely see that even still today. And this is what we do uh, at, at Hackerspaces for sure, where people are encouraged to explore and try things and, um, and see what grows from that. And many people end up making a living from that. But this has been happening here way before Hackerspaces. Um, uh, where I start looking at Silicon Valley is, well, of course I knew about the semiconductor industry and the first time I came here seeing these huge buildings with the names of places I've only seen in catalogs, like National Semiconductor on a building. That was kind of exciting for me as a geek. Um, but, um, but the Homebrew Computer Club, which I'd heard about, because I'd been playing with computers since I was a little kid, which was very geeky uh, at the time, um, but it always excited me. And here are these people, None of them could make a computer on their own, but with the technology that existed, uh, they could, they thought, make a computer, that, a small one, with a handle, it's portable. They could lug it around and have a computer at home. None of them can do it on their own, but collectively they could teach each other and encourage each other to explore and try things, and they could and did create several of the first personal computers. And one of those companies is the biggest capitalized company, corporation in the planet now, Apple. Um, but so much of what we know about computers, pretty much everything, grew out of that, of course, from what they learned in the giants before them. And um, that can't be copied. Silicon Valley wasn't created, um, it happened. And um, what we can do, though, is get people together in a community, encourage people to explore what it is that excites them, what they're passionate about, and try things, and make a safe environment for failing. Failing is never fun, but we do learn a lot from it, and from failing we share what works, what doesn't with others, and encourage each other and learn from that, and we keep trying, and eventually we find things that are meaningful. And when you find something that's meaningful for you, it may be meaningful for others. And if it's meaningful for others, now you have a startup worth starting because that's what people will pay you for. And so entrepreneurship at its best is this approach, I think, rather than I'm gonna make money, I'm gonna have a startup, what should I make money on? I don't know, other people are making apps, I'll make an app. And um, then you have these Silicon Valley buildings, looking buildings, full of startups making orange apps or yellow apps instead of the blue one or whatever. So um, um, that's not very meaningful. But we can encourage, I think, um, this kind of community building where meaningful projects come, where meaningful startups come, where we can put meaningful things into the world rather than things that we have to manipulate people into buying through manipulative marketing techniques. So anyways, I'll stop.
Well, and I, I have a few things um, to add to your rant. And actually, can I just say that today, I, I, I in my head have a running contest for the dumbest sounding techie thing um, that I hear about. And I have a new winner um, as of today. It is called the Froyo Robot. Um, and I can't figure out exactly what it does, but I think it's like a little robot that goes around selling frozen yogurt. Um, and so for some reason that, that really tickles me as sort of an orange app equivalent. Um, so what I want to talk about a little bit are these weirdos and to think about them in a slightly different way. Um, and, and that is to think of them as risk takers. And I think that it's really important to think, um, when you think about who these risk takers were and who they are, um, it really points to something that, again, I think is lost in the story of Silicon Valley, which is almost from the beginning, the people who built Silicon Valley came from somewhere else. So uh, even as early as the 1970s, you're uh, seeing the people in uh, Silicon Valley, um, the percent that are born outside of the United States already at that point is running at about double the rest of the country. And even before that, the people who were coming uh, to, the people who were starting Silicon Valley all came from somewhere else, with the exception of Gordon Moore, who was born in Pescadero. That whole generation was all born someplace else. A lot of them had been stationed in uh, San Francisco for World War II, looked around, it was beautiful, it was cheap, which is impossible to believe, but it was. <laughs> and uh, they sort of resolved to come back here. There were huge defense contractors here. And that was a draw for a lot of people. It was a good, reliable job. But these were people who were coming from somewhere else. Then you had people starting to come from all over the world. And today, uh, two-thirds of the people working in the tech industry in Silicon Valley, who are between the ages of 25 and 44, two-thirds of them were born outside of the United States. And I think that what you have is right now, for as long as we can keep it, you have a place that has attracted people, the best people from all over the world who are interested in taking risks and building new things. And I think um, that has, has, is another one of the secrets of Silicon Valley's success and points to the sort of under, underlying value system that we're, we are uh, talking about today, which is this remarkable um, sense of openness um, to people who came from other places. And maybe something that we can talk about um, in the Q&A, maybe people have some ideas because I, I legitimately don't understand this. I don't understand why a culture that has very, very much, all the numbers um, prove it out, have been so open to outsiders from other parts of the world, how close this culture has been to women. Uh, so that, that to me is a, a confusing thing um, that I would be curious to get your feedback on. But So that's one thing I would point out is the weirdos are, are also great, great risk takers, and they come from everywhere. Um, a second thing that I would really want to point out, too, is that it's only very recently that San Francisco gets folded into Silicon Valley. And an important reason that Silicon Valley started where it did and not in San Francisco, which would have been a logical place, that's the West Coast <laughs> Financial Center. And you did have early venture capitalists, actually, up here in the city. Um, is that this was a union town. There were two reasons that it wasn't here in San Francisco. One, it was a union town, and people didn't want that on the peninsula. Um, two was uh, that you needed a lot of space, because people don't really know this now, but those buildings um, that Mitch is talking about that had National and Intel and all this on the sides of it, those had factories. Those were called, the factories were called fabs, but they were honest to God factories. It's something like 200,000 um, uh, manufacturing jobs were added in the valley over the course of, I think, like the 70s and the 80s. It was a very strong, excellent jobs, middle class, you didn't have to go to college, economy built around actually building physical things you could touch. Computers, hardware, peripherals, fancy phone systems, 
this was this is what was happening in Silicon Valley. And when people say, well, why is it now that Silicon Valley's up in San Francisco when it never used to be really, the answer is uh, software. You don't need a giant facility to build a, any, to do anything with software now, right? You just, you, you need your laptop, you need access to the cloud, you've gotta be able to, you know, it's, it's not space intensive at all. And so that's one of the reasons why you've seen the expansion up into the city. And then the last thing <laughs> that I would point to is and when you talk about the role of the counterculture in the valley's birth, and it's really, really important. And people do very rightfully talk about the homebrew um, computing company, about the people's computing company, about the philosophy of let's get more information to more people because that's the way democracy ought to work. Let's let people be building the systems. Um, this, all of that is absolutely true. And I would also point to, um, again, something on a very practical level, uh, which is what the um, anti-Vietnam War sentiment meant in terms of the type of jobs uh, that people chose to do. Because when you think about where, say, a graphics expert would go to work, or someone who's an expert in uh, computing or semiconductor logic or something like that, in up, up until the Vietnam War, those people all went to work for the Department of the Defense or a defense contractor. Maybe they would, they were just, start. Intel starts in 68, Fairchild started at the end of the 1950s. So you had a few people who would go there, but still those companies, particularly Fairchild, sold so much to the Department of Defense. What happened with the Vietnam War is that you had people finishing college or finishing graduate school, and, and the very people who would have gone to work for the Department of Defense decided, I don't want to. So they ended up working at places like Atari, which, I mean, was this crazy place. I mean, people look at Atari and they, they all talk about the naked hot tub parties that were, well, they, Atari <laughs> literally held board meetings in hot tubs. And it, it, you know they, they had a marijuana review board to go to where people would go up and smoke to decide what sort of video game features they should add. And I mean, it was, Atari was this crazy, crazy, crazy place. Um, and if you look underneath it, there were some incredibly gifted graphics experts who could have gone to work anywhere and who when you talk to them, will say things like, I never, I never wanted to become you know, an evil-minded capitalist. You know, I just didn't want to work for the Department of Defense. Exactly the same thing um, with Xerox PARC. The, and um, the, the people who built the computer at Xerox PARC called the Alto, which is the one that then Steve Jobs and his engineers saw and eventually morphed into the Lisa and the Mac. It's the foundation of the overlapping windows that we use and what you see is what you get, interfaces and mice and pretty much everything you associate with a personal computer was developed, networking, <laughs> easy to use email systems, this all actually got its start um, at Xerox Park or came to fruition is probably the best way to describe it at Xerox Park. Well, Xerox Park was run by a guy named Bob Taylor, who's someone I write about in uh, my Troublemakers book. Well, Bob Taylor, had run um, what was called the Information Processing Technology Office at um, ARPA for the Department of Defense. Taylor had run that office. Taylor was the person who convinced the Department of Defense to start the ARPANET. It was Department of Defense money that went and funded all sorts of research in things like distributed computing and graphics and uh, these things that became the foundation for personal computing. And Bob Taylor left the Department of Defense, left ARPA in protest over the Vietnam War. And when he started Xerox Park, he attracted all of these young, brilliant, brilliant people who had previously been re receiving Defense Department funding who wanted still to work with Taylor and were thrilled not to be working as, as part of that complex. So I think that the relationship um, with the Vietnam War is really, really important to understand when we talk about the role of the counterculture and also when we think about the role of the government. Because yes, they wanted to leave defense funded uh, work, but at the same time, 
none of this would be here without that. I'm, um, so it's, it's a very, we can't simply talk about it in, in black and white terms, in terms of the role of the government, the role of the counterculture, or the role of the academy. I mean, part of the, everyone thinks so, people dress so casually in Silicon Valley because, you know, uh, sticking it to the man, don't want to be uptight, East Coast types, and, and, and that's all true, that influence is there, but also a whole lot of people come straight out of graduate school where they worked through the night in their jeans, they slept under their desks. It's, it's this incredible mashup of cultures in Silicon Valley uh, that all kind of came together and reinforce your point that it's not something that you, you know, this is people come to me all the time and, and I'm sure you, what is the recipe for Silicon Valley's success? And I mean, you can't, you can't reproduce it. I do think that different places can figure out what is distinctive about where they are and build off of that to participate in this culture in a very significant way in, and in the uh, global <laughs> tech economy as well. Yeah, and, and, and play off of the idealism of the people in the culture, wherever that is, as people did uh, here back in the day, um, and in some ways even still. You know, so much of the money did come from the US military, and, um, and yet the people who were making all of the technology happen really were freaks, um, so many of them anyways. Super intelligent, creative, freaky people, very idealistic, and um, they, really wanted all the information, all the technology to be free. You know, like Steve Wozniak, who was um, the engineering geeky person behind Apple, creating the Apple I and then the Apple II computer, um, <laughs> really wanted the whole thing to be open, as he talks about it now, in ways. Um, Steve Jobs made it closed, uh, as he saw it necessary for making a huge corporation. But when people were creating all this, they really wanted it open and sharing. And they had uh, very much anti-Vietnam War, anti-establishment, um, but they were using military money in order to do what they were doing quite often. Um, and as I see it, that, that might be why things have become so different nowadays with those roots. Hard to say, um, but whatever uh, money you accept, whatever resources you use to create what you create might be um, uh, an important part of where your technology goes after you put it out in the world, because we have no control over what happens after we put it out in the world. Yeah, um, I think so I mean, I, th I think that open systems point is a really good one. I mean, I think it's, it's, a, it's a little complicated because I mean, the IBM PC, of course, established its stronghold because that system was so open relative, certainly, you know, to the Apple system at the time. So it, it, it wasn't, you know, strictly open versus closed just at Apple, but I think that where we are now, actually I really recommend um, in this Sunday's New York Times Magazine, there's a very long, this upcoming one, there's a really long article um, by Stephen uh, B. Johnson on, um, it has the word Bitcoin in the title, but close your eyes, go past that word. Um, he, and he actually, make, he has a really interesting uh, model for understanding the birth of um, the internet that I think is relevant here. Um, he is talking about how the, uh, you can think of there as being two, two layers to the internet and how the underbelly layer is exactly what we're talking about, developed with open, protocol, open protocols um, like TCP IP and FTP and all of, all of that sort of underlying stuff having been developed um, with this sort of open uh, shared mentality. And then what we've layered on top of it has been uh, the, the sort of Google, Facebook, private model, closed uh, garden type. Um, and his argument, and I don't know enough about Bitcoin and the blockchain to know how much water this holds, but he's a very good writer, so it's quite compelling, um, is that um, he thinks Bitcoin, whatever happens to Bitcoin is just going to, um, we'll see. But the really relevant thing is that the blockchain, rep and he explains what that means, which is 
great for those of us who were not quite clear on it, um, that the blockchain, um, because it is a decentralized sort of system, offers a possible way back to this notion of something um, that is more decentralized and, and more open, uh, which will be interesting. And I'm glad he decoupled that from the whole question of Bitcoin, which is just like, right now like you know so we'll we'll see um how that works but i thought that was an interesting contrast that he drew yeah yeah and bitcoin we all know that's a speculative bubble right now but there is a lot of interesting uh technology that goes behind it and the blockchain is something that a lot of people have been uh, uh rallying around as possibilities for the future um we'll see how that goes uh if people pick up on it uh, there are people proposing that this is great for democracy because now we can vote on everything just from your home computer. Well, yeah, if you have a computer. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, do we really want 100% of the American public uh, voting on sewage systems uh, uh, infrastructure for the country? People who know nothing about this. So I don't know. Uh, obviously, I have some reservations, but um, I think there's some interesting possibilities. But uh, the thing. Uh, Internet in particular, it started off as a U.S. military thing to have a decentralized uh, computer network so that in World War III, when two-thirds of the planet is destroyed, including two-thirds of the, of the computers, the military could still communicate <laughs> with itself. But that's, wait, 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 that's actually not true. No? I mean, okay, no, right. that's actually Correct a myth. Um, <laughs> I just happen to know this because I said this is literally, I just read all of the ARPA um, materials about this. No, I mean, it actually was developed out of this whole philosophy that started in um, as early as 1960 around this notion of we need to have all different types of computers being able to speak to each other. Now, what happened was, um, and, and that's like a document, like you can actually trace that out. Um, what happened was that almost immediately they had to start justifying it in terms of um, surviving, a, you know, some sort of a nuclear attack um, and streamlining military expenditures and such, uh, but that that honestly wasn't the wasn't the origin of it. It really was um, this group of thinkers uh, led by a guy named um, J. C. R. Licklider, uh, who believed in the importance of um, of a network uh, to be able to connect people. Um, and and sort of expand um, the, the, the communities that people could participate in. It was a very, very open, idealistic idea behind it that needed to be dressed up in a military uniform in order you know, to be sold. Oh, that's interesting. So the, the, the military application came later, really. Right. Um, Yes, because I always knew there, was ideal, there were idealistic people behind it, pushing it for having decentralized open network for making the world a better place as they saw it. Um, and uh, over time, the network got bigger and bigger, and it became a, a, the World Wide Web on top of it, and a way for lots of corporations to sell things, and uh, as the uh, need for more bandwidth to get more and more content, uh, uh, kept going on, uh, it, then corporations created the infrastructure which made it more and more and more centralized to the point now where it's highly centralized. Mm -hmm. So uh, when it's highly centralized, um, you can still have something like Twitter being used for um, basically being an important part of the Arab Spring, but then you can also have uh, places like the Egyptian government turning the switch off. And, um, or when there's a protest uh, being planned about police, um, uh, BART police in particular a few years ago, uh, a, a planned uh, protest in uh, the, a BART station, uh, AT&T can just turn off the GSM network in the BART station and make it very difficult for people to coordinate. Um, if there's a way for the, uh, what we call the internet now to become more decentralized, then I think there's more possibilities for more uh, positive things and not just um, uh, profit for a handful of corporations primarily. 
Yeah, I mean, one of the things that the two of us talked about um, on the phone the other day is, um, and, you, and you were pointing to this just now about the blockchain, that's something that has been characteristic of I would say technological advances in general, just not in not only in the valley, um, is that change happens so quickly, and these have proliferated so dramatically that um, the technologies very quickly outrun the creators of them. So that you can begin something with the most idealistic or the most stupid idea in the world and it can very quickly you know I'm, I'm thinking of Facebook beginning as hot or not when I say that um, but um, and have it very quickly become something um, that you have no control over you know and 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 I mean we see this again and again not just in the technological sphere but where we have the notion of you know, bringing democracy to this country would be the greatest thing ever, and then they elect a leadership that we find repressive, or whatever the case may be. And so I think that this happens again and again and again, but what what's happens with the technology is it happens kind of at warp speed. Um, so that we're in the situation now where we have uh, this incredible compute power that we carry in our pockets, and um, only now, recently, have looked down to say, oh my God, this phone, I mean, like, when I can't find my phone, it's, it's a feeling of true panic. You know, I immediately start thinking, when did it last back up working, you know? Um, and when you think about the intimacy of your connection with that technology and how much it knows about you and how much you have voluntarily shared with all of these organizations around you, um, it makes sense why all of a sudden, and it really has been all of a sudden, we've seen this turn away from what really has been, let's, let's say the valley starts in the 50s. So we're, we're, we're seeing now, we're going into a seventh decade of what had just been really almost unmitigated, what I would just describe as raw, raw Silicon Valley. We love Silicon Valley. You know, it's the golden child of the golden state. It's the source of our productivity. It's the source of our global leadership. Um, there never really had been any, any doubts significantly um, cast on, on um, basically the tech industry until about two years ago. And, and then, and, and this is new um, because there have been every single, I would say, decade or generation of technology, because the thing that's actually interesting about Silicon Valley is not why did Silicon Valley happen here, but why is Silicon Valley continually reinventing itself? That's a really interesting question, right? I mean, it starts out as instruments and moves into microchips, and then the decade that I write about, the reason that in this latest book, the reason I was so interested in it is that you had Apple, Intel, Genentech, Atari, Kleiner Perkins, Sequoia Capital, the first ARPANET transmission. You have, you have you Stanford deciding to start licensing its um, intellectual property. Before um, 1970, Stanford had gotten $3,000 from all of, the, uh, all of the inventions of its faculty, staff, and students for the previous 13 years. This very unknown man named Niels Raymer starts this little technology licensing offices, and now Stanford has made two billion dollars um, from its investments in uh, the the work of its faculty and staff. Um, but that so you've got this incredible generation of the '70s where you have personal computing and video games and biotech and just one thing after another, venture capital, and then you go into the '80s and they're they're going into networking and you go into cloud computing and you go into you know we're mobile and social and all of this sort of stuff tesla the cars or you know and so that's the interesting question um is is where you know where where did it all come from but in all of that time there's there, there's always it's always been too expensive it's always been too crowded um it's uh, the, there's been the japanese are going to kill silicon valley the chinese are going to kill silicon valley india is going to kill so yt y2k was going to kill silicon valley um but no one ever said hmm, i wonder if maybe we want to slow down silicon valley or you know, <laughs> that's just never been on the table before and that is something new and different the the, the fear of the valley uh the valley's products um is really a new thing 
Yeah, well, now that um, there's some pretty interesting monopolies being formed uh, with so much of our information being stored in their databases, uh, and we've seen through the Snowden revelations that um, the NSA has a backdoor whether those corporations want them or not. And some of those corporations were totally fine with it, and maybe they got paid a lot for being fine with it too, we don't know. Um, so, um, and with the recent election, it seems that none of the leadership of either of our two parties are happy with the current uh, head of the executive branch. So they're seeing the responsibility of Twitter, of Facebook, of Google in um, uh, having that happen. Uh, those three corporations, uh, even if the people, the individuals there are not too happy with that same leadership, um, made a lot of money from it, a lot of money. Um, selling outrage sparks a lot of people using these platforms, which makes them a lot of money. Uh, just how much, uh, people only guess, but it's definitely billions. So um, now people are talking about regulating this for the first time, like a utility. They basically have a monopoly for certain things. They're given this infrastructure by um, uh, our tax money in some ways, so it makes sense to regulate it. And right now, those three companies and others are saying, well, let's self-regulate ourselves. Uh, and uh, I don't really have much more to say about that than my, the look on my face right now. So um, uh, we'll see how that goes. And uh, I'm hoping that there can be some regulation on that so that we can hopefully move forward. I don't know if blockchain is any part of that or not, but you know, uh, just going back on something you were talking about before, once, and something I mentioned earlier as well, once you create uh, a tool, and technology really is all about tools, and uh, Silicon Valley has put many, many tools out, uh, and from those other tools are based on the previous tools, the technology builds on the technology, which is why things are moving so quickly at an exponential rate with technology built on the previous technologies. Um, once you put something out into the world, it, it's really a powerful tool that can be used for anything. Your intent, no matter how idealistic you are, it will be used in the context of our culture. And um, whether Facebook, uh, uh, Twitter, and Google wanted it, they were going to become a backdoor to the NSA. I just came back from Germany where I went to the Stasi Museum. Um, <laughs> oh, God. Those people uh, wanted to be better than they were, but they were quite effective at spying on almost all the people in their country. They never, ever, ever had a wet dream about what the NSA is doing in our country now, paid for by our tax dollars. Um, so that's, this is the dark side of things. In myself, personally, every single place I ever worked at until creating TV Be Gone, 100% of the places I worked for before, the military came along and wanted to use what we created for their purposes, which were not the purposes of any of the people, myself or any of the people I worked with. For instance, the virtual reality place, VPL, uh, we did not want to sell to the military. They wanted to buy from us, but we wouldn't um, sell to them. Uh, they ended up buying one of our um, virtual reality systems that I spent three months of my life creating um, personally, because it took a lot of personal work back then. They took that, uh, bought it through the University of Central Florida, and uh, used it for World War III training simulator. And I helped. So um, these are the kind of things that can happen when you put uh, whatever technology out into the world. We have no control over that. So I think it's really, really important for everyone who is creating in whatever realm you're creating in, to think about the context that you're going to release things in and um, um, there's no guarantees but at least if you think about what you're doing and work on things that can be used overwhelmingly for the positive then you have more of a chance of creating a better world for yourself and those around you. I think the other thing um, that we were talking about earlier is uh, you were talking about the profit made by creating outrage. And I mean, I, I do think that we ourselves as users of this technology are also somewhat culpable 
um, if we didn't click so much, they wouldn't, it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't exist, it wouldn't be such a popular product if we didn't want it. So it's, it's a little bit of a circular matter. And I, I think that um, it's going to be very interesting with the new regulations that have been implemented in Europe to see how is this going to, how's this going to play out. Um, it, it, I just had coffee, I guess two days ago with two guys um, from the Netherlands and, and I, was, I was saying to them, well, um, you, you in the UK or are you, EU are way ahead of us um, on the regulatory front of these companies. And he said, I, I'd never thought about this before. Um, he said, well, they aren't our companies. And I said, well, what do you mean? Um, and he, he said, well, we've, we've barely touched, like Volkswagen, for example, whereas we in the United States impose these enormous fines on them. Um, and he was saying it's much, 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 much easier to rein in companies that don't have employees who are going to vote you out of office or, or whose profits don't contribute to your taxes. I mean, I, and I thought that was a really interesting idea because I have been um, looking, I, I just had never occurred to me before, but I think there's some legitimacy there. And, and he was basically saying we'll never get companies like yours, which I think is kind of interesting um, as well. Yeah, it's definitely a different, different setup over there. It's much easier to start a company in the United States. Uh, there's a lot more regulation in Europe. Um, and also in Europe, there's at least a little bit of distance between how much money you have um, and the likelihood of getting elected. Of course, the more money you have everywhere, the more likely it is you'll get elected. Um, but um, here, it's direct. Uh, the more money you spend, the more likely it is you'll get elected and of course the corporations are paying for those elections so there's payback and etc so um, but that's off topic um, I think uh, uh, you know like there's um, I don't know I, I, we should probably wrap it up and open it up for questions Just what I was thinking. <laughs> and um, but I, I don't want to end it on that super negative note so um, you know like uh, you were saying um, the users of these platforms um, have some culpability in all of this. It's very, very, it's very, very compelling when there's outrage on the internet. Can you imagine outrage on the internet? There's outrage on the internet. I have to do something, and you want to press that button. Maybe you should just take a breath first. But uh, it is very compelling, um, and um, all of us collectively, just like voting. Um, each single vote isn't worth all that much, but together, our collective behavior means a lot. So, um, you know, do what you do as consciously as you can. We'll mess up, but learn from whatever you do, just like people in Silicon Valley have all the way up till here, and, um, and do things better as a result. Yeah, I mean, my, my so we'll see how large scale um, uh, regulation actually plays out. I mean, that'll be really interesting to see um, and to be involved with. My, I have this little fantasy that um, all of those terms of service that you scroll past and click the, you know, check the box and hit click. I want to see some version of, you know how they've changed your credit card statement? Remember how the credit card statements used to be impossible to read? And now there's this big box that says, if you pay only this amount, you're going to owe this amount. I would love to see a very simplified terms of service. I saw somebody, someone in the UK did this for Instagram um, and showed a bunch of 14 year olds. Look, this is what you're saying. They can take your pictures. They can, you know, and, um, and it really changed the way that people thought about what they were doing. Um, and I think understanding better what it is that we're doing when we interact with these sites is is really important and something that um, we should be pushing for. And understanding, A, what are we doing when we click this button? And B, what are you doing? What are you companies doing with what we give you? And that's what we need to know. Yeah, I think it's really a great idea that the tools that we put out in the world are working for us and um, not for um, something underneath the I agree button. <coughs> okay, so we will wrap it up there. Here endeth the formal discussion.
Um, and we'll move to Q&A, and our understanding is that there are mics, where are the mics gonna be? Ah, they're gonna go sort of to either side, it sounds like, and. Yeah, and we were told that uh, if people wanna ask questions to line up behind right. either microphone, and if you have a, um, uh, an ability issue around that, then raise your hand and a mic can come to you. <laughs> um, yeah, so, is this on? It is. Sounds okay. like. Um, my question is really around like the funding for research. So you mentioned, you know, your virtual reality work, you got approached by the military. I know that like, <laughs> I know that like a lot of big universities, Stanford included, Berkeley included, have really close relationships with the State Department, and that kind of determines what type of science is funded, what type of discoveries are made. Um, and so there's kind of like, even before the discoveries are actually made, if something can't be weaponized in some future form, the likelihood that it gets funding is less. So like, speaking about what you guys have been speaking about and you know, trying to think about the ethics and everything, when you take that into account, like, have you seen other funding sources emerging? Like, how, how do you explore something you feel is truly good, but also be able to fund it? Um. I, at the university that I went to, the University of Illinois, um, it's a big engineering school, and I um, found there was only one lab out of the entire engineering school of 40,000 students uh, that was not funded by the military. That's the lab I went to. And uh, while all the other labs had people working on missile guidance systems or whatever stupid kind of things, um, this lab had people working on music synthesizers and robots and flying machines and electric vehicles and um, all sorts of really fun things. We weren't constrained by military application because there was no funding source. Um, the lab, of course, was always threatened of being closed because grant money into the university is evidently a good thing. But um, at the last minute, every time the professor was about to get fired, there'd be some donation from uh, a student who went on to work for, for instance, Intel, and then getting a million dollars worth of microcontrollers in 1978, which was kind of a big deal. And, um, and then all of us who were working on our projects could put lots of microcontrollers and things and make our projects even cooler. And people went off from there to, um, well, the person who founded uh, Tesla Motors came from there. He was working on an electric vehicle that was only this big, but uh, it, before it got taken over by Elon Musk, um, <laughs> who was started by my friend Martin Eberhardt, and uh, many other people, the person who was instrumental in creating um, uh, formal verification in software also came from there. And that wouldn't have happened if it was funded by the military because we would have been constrained to work on things that had military applications. Of course, since then, robots have become military. When you put something out in the world, you really have no control over what will happen. But um, still, if you are funded directly from a source whose values don't align with yours, why are they giving you the money if they're not gonna use it for these things that don't align with yours? So I, personally, I think it's really very important to only accept money from sources that align with your values, whether it's a person or an organization or a government. Uh, so I guess I have, um, I'd point to three potential, you're asking where, where, do the, where should the money, where, where can you get the money? Um, one is I think there are a lot of people who are trying to fund socially responsible technologies. Um, two is, and this should have been number one, um, the, you're really pointing to the importance of federally fund, funded basic research, which has been, a dimin has been just diminishing as a portion of the federal budget for a very long time. But the, you know, large amounts of money to go explore and we don't know what the outcome is going to be has been the source of so much innovation and progress so that you know that i think is a vitally important thing 
And three, if there's one thing in the world I'm excited about with Bitcoin, is what would somebody who somehow became a billionaire out of Bitcoin decide to fund? Um, that I'd be curious to see. And I, I mean, really, that could be all over the place. I don't know. But yeah, so there are three sources for you. Should we go to this? Hi. Um, do you think that the use of psychedelics in this area in the 60s and 70s played a role in Silicon Valley developing in the way that it did? Could you talk about that a little? Well, I, know, I know a lot of people uh, who were in part of the Silicon Valley scene before I arrived who did a lot of acid and mushrooms and MDA, which was the precursor of MDMA ecstasy. Um, and these are all really brilliant people. Um, whether that had an influence on what they produced or if it was just the environment which was uh, a culture where people did those kind of things and they would have done it anyways, it's hard to say. Um, but uh, the environment that uh, was loose enough for people to be able to be uh, doing all these kind of things and yet still respect it, even though it's illegal, is kind of indicative of the mindset. Um, and you know that kind of openness, uh, I think, is uh, a much more creative, fertile ground than one where everything must be just so. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, like I said, it just came from Germany. There's a lot of um, uh, really good German engineering, but uh, German engineering isn't really the place for wild innovation and creativity. Um, it's a different culture, whereas the culture here um, is much more anything goes, and there is a lot of innovation and creativity. Um, of course, I'm talking vague generalities. There's a lot of super innovative and creative people in Germany and everywhere in the world, but overall the culture um, I think comes first, and the culture is one that allowed for people to experiment in other ways, including the drug use. Yeah, I mean, I actually think that's a, um, that's a, uh, I, I think that's a, a good answer. There were definitely people running around um, who were, were trying everything, and drugs were part of the everything um, that they were trying. I also think that um, it was greatly exaggerated, um, people's understanding of it, particularly from the East Coast. So there are these hilarious letters or comments that say the management of Xerox corporate based in New York made, or uh, they moved New York and Connecticut, about um, the people in Palo Alto and how there were all these, you know, it's like the Berkeley campus because everyone eats tofu and the girls are all slim and drawn out and this whole, this whole sort of notion that the entire place was kind of writhing with this um, alternative view where, you know, hold your breath or you're going to get a contact high. I mean, this, that just really um, was a lot of outsiders looking in because for all of the vision and imagination that you're talking about, I mean, it takes so much nose to the grindstone, just hard focused work to actually turn that into something because, I mean, the dreamy ideals are only as good as they, their actual creation can be. And so there was much more of the nose to the grindstone up all night type of behavior than the, you know, spaced out of our minds, um, lying on the floor looking at our hands kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. um, my question, is this working? Um, you were just almost speaking to my question because I read an article recently in the Scientific American about what makes people creative. And I'm a creative person, though more artistically than technologically. And I am considered the office weirdo, I feel. Um, and this article was saying that creative people have less inhibitors throughout their circuits, in their brains, than other people. I'm, I'm just paraphrasing. Um, most people, they, they'll see something and they'll only see it in that context. I'm the kind of person, I'll see that thing and then suddenly I say, well, why can't I transpose it to this context, this other context? And so I tend to find innovative solutions for myself doing that and of course new artistic ideas could design ideas and that kind of thing and so this so people like us seem weird to others 
And so again, it gets back to culture, the environment. And so I think in many parts of the world, they do have certain uh, sort of like, I don't know, tracks that people are supposed to move in throughout their lives. And if you move out of that, you're not appreciated. So maybe you can speak more to that. That's why maybe there aren't Silicon Valleys in other parts of the world. Because these kinds of people generally are seen, are not appreciated by most of society, except here. Yeah, well, um, there's certainly uh, places in the world where um, uh, people are more or less encouraged to be themselves and other places where people are more encouraged to uh, act some conception of normal. And um, San Francisco Bay Area is a place where uh, there's often been periods of celebrations of people being their own weird selves. And um, so, of course, the people, like in the gold rush, who, who's going to leave their entire life behind to seek gold? Of course, there'll be people who want to get rich quick, but even those people, they're leaving their life behind. That was an isolated place way the hell out west, and um, they may never see anything of their old life ever again. These are people probably who want to live a different life. And, uh, As and is true for immigrants today to the Valley. Indeed. And I wish the current leader in the executive branch would take note of that. Um, so, um, but yeah, and, and so still the, uh, the Bay Area is a place where people can leave their lives behind and come and reinvent themselves and it's encouraged. Um, you know, it's, it's never easy, but uh, it's encouraged here and, and often celebrated. So. Uh, but this is what, you know, art is technology too. Everything's tech, a paintbrush, the, the pigments inside of oil paints or acrylics. I mean, all of this is technology, it's all tools uh, for, for certain things, art, visual art, music, whatever, uh, computers, cell phones, uh, computer networking, all of this is technology or even biology. Wherever you're gonna put it, it requires people to see problems consciously where other people aren't really necessarily aware of it and then being able to come up with a solution to those problems and then present it in a way that other people resonate with. That has to be people who see and do things differently than others. And this is a place where that happens. And this is a place that attracts people who, who see that way. I mean, even when I think back to Bob Noyce um, in the 60s, um, he was saying that a lot of people, um, I'm trying to remember his exact quote, but he was essentially saying that very often um, people think that what there's a need for, for example, um, is a different kind of drill bit, but really what people want is a hole, and you need to, you know, you need to focus on what is it that people actually want, not, not the, the specific tool that might give it to them, um, or, you know, Helping, trying to even get beyond what people want is really the big, what people think they want is, is a very big challenge, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, or even giving them something uh, that solves a problem they didn't even know existed until you give them the tool for it. Um, and I found like for TV Be Gone, that was the case for the people who like TV Be Gone. Um, people weren't even aware that little by little and then very quickly, TVs were coming everywhere in our public places um, until TV Be Gone came out and that gave people uh, the ability to see that, oh yeah, I don't like that. I'm distracted everywhere I go. Um, and even if people don't buy it, now they have that notion. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. Yeah. Changing how you see the world. Yeah. Hi, um, first of all, thanks for coming. This is a great pairing. I really enjoyed it. Um, and my question is about decentralized internet and if you can just explain a little more what that means, what that kind of would tangibly look like, and um, like who's, is there a movement, is like who's kind of pushing for it and how? I don't know if there's a movement. There's definitely a bunch of people trying to work on it. When the internet started, uh, uh, well at least when I first got uh, into the internet, it was um, uh, the 1980s, uh, there were bulletin boards, uh, BBSs, bulletin board service, uh, where people had to call in and you could be connected. Um, that was really just one 
source to many, but soon thereafter, any computer could be hooked to any computer through the phone system, and there was no central place. Um, but uh, pretty soon there were these internet service providers who would be a, a central hub where all the computers could connect to each other through these little hubs. But there were lots of these little hubs all over the place, and those little hubs were connected to each other. So if I sent a message to you, it, who knows how it would get there. It would go into this hub and out this way, and it's like, oh, that's a dead end, come back and go around, and eventually it finds its way to you, because each one's kind of going, I think it's that way. And, um, but more and more as people were using uh, more and more content with pictures, more and more high resolution pictures, videos, and um, uh, bigger and bigger uh, files, uh, we needed more infrastructure and the cities uh, provided um, phone lines to the phone companies and those were upgraded by the phone companies and also then cable TV and all of those corporations start centralizing all of the infrastructure and they become more and more important. Um, all along, they're trying to clamor for the ability to charge for their infrastructure, even though it was provided in quite often by the cities paid for, for by our tax dollars. Um, and up till just very recently, they were always told, no, <laughs> in no uncertain terms. That's called net neutrality, and that's now possibly over. Um, so it's become very centralized. How to make it uncentralized uh, after it's become highly centralized might be much more difficult. In these conferences that I go to, there are groups of people trying to come up with another internet that's an alternative one that can be connected to the internet we all know. Um, and uh, as more and more people are doing that, maybe we'll have more small internet service providers again that are doing things actually to provide a service rather than only to maximize profits in the next quarter. And uh, that might provide a possibility. People are wanting to use blockchain for pretty much anything. And uh, at the conferences I go to, if anyone has the word blockchain in the title of a proposed talk, it's, uh, it's denied immediately. But, um, uh, but I think there are possibilities there because it is a way that has all of the information of everything that's gone on right there in one file that's manageable so things can be uh, um, uh, recorded in a way that's totally open and that might be able to lend itself to this. So uh, we'll see. Um, in terms of organizations, I mean, one I can think of is the Electronic Frontier Foundation um, points a lot in this direction. And actually, can I just ask, does anyone in the audience have any um, knowledge on this that would be useful? Is there any, any hands there? Okay, we're all in the dark. Uh, but I do think EFF is a good place um, to start. They're a great place. Huh. Oh, yeah. Pseudomesh? Pseudomesh. Pseudomesh. Uh -huh. Pseudomesh. The pseudo room at um, the Omni Commons in Oakland. Okay. They're hoping to sort of build. Yeah, that's part of what I was talking about, actually. So in Germany, there's a group uh, who have been working on uh, Freifunk, uh, a, a mesh network where uh, big parts of Hamburg, big parts of Berlin, and uh, many other uh, German cities have free internet. And uh, the version of that in the United States, and I think there's only one place so far, is in Oakland. Uh, and that's being created by people at the hackerspace called Pseudo Room, S-U-D-O, Pseudo Room, in Oakland, uh, at 40th and Shattuck, another way cool hackerspace. All right, there we go. All right. Hi, I was hoping you could clarify just a little bit more about like the things that I understand to be the counterculture, psychedelics, free love, hippie dresses, all that, and the kinds of products that Silicon Valley built. I don't see the link, the link between free love and all that and integrated circuits and search algorithms. Okay, I, I have such so much to say about this. Um, but did you have more? No. Okay. Um, yeah, so one of the more, um, I think actually wonderful quotes came from Gordon Moore in the uh, early 1970s where he said, you know, people think um, that change or something like that 
is coming from all of these young people in the streets. But really, we're the real revolutionaries. And he was talking about, you know, the engineers and their short white, their short sleeved white shirts and their skinny ties and this sort of thing. Um, rapidly morphing into those hideous giant 1970s ties. And, um, and I mean, I think there's something to that. I think that if you try to, try to draw a direct line between um, the People's Park protests, for example, and the um, you know free communal stew, and um, if you look at the, because that's my book opens talking about those protests, if you look at um, the, the newspaper articles about that time, the complaints that um, say the National Guard had that there were beautiful young women not wearing bras who were offering them brownies that turned out to be laced with LSD. Um, and then you try to figure out, okay, how did that create any of this stuff? Um, you're not going to find you know, a direct line sometimes in um, code names and such for different products. You might see a little wink wink. Um, you can tell I don't really know how to wink. Um, but um, I do think uh, the one place that you really do see it is in what I was talking about earlier in terms of those people when they went and um, got jobs when they graduated would not work for these uh, defense related industries. And that did end up leading directly, say, to the rise of the video game industry. I mean, pretty much that one you can draw a, a, a pretty nice line there. Um, I think that you're really looking more in the realm of culture than specific technologies. I, I would particularly say that something like the something like the microchip people, that's really the generation before. The closest connection um, you might see that would be really familiar would be Apple, which did have very much of um, this sort of countercultural spirit in that, you know, the first products, the Apple II in particular, which way outsold the Mac. Everyone thinks the Mac was this, you know, revolutionary product, was this little bitty thing, particularly compared to the Apple II and especially compared to the IBM PC. Um, that, you know, that was an open platform and that was deliberately so. And there were all sorts of um, these fan clubs with these hilarious names like apple pie and um, I, all these terrible, terrible apple puns about them um, that, that did have that sort of communal spirit behind them. Um, and then those people in turn influenced the birth of Sun and a bunch of the workstation companies. And I think you have to think of it um, as almost like a grain of sand in a pearl. And, you know that, that kind of grows layers around it and for your you're not going to be able to see a direct link but it was there as part of the of the friction that then led um, to where we got later Hi. Um, this doesn't seem to be on. Oh, thank you um, yeah you brought up the question of why women are so Looted so system, almost systematically. Mm -hmm. I think that um, my own experience, and I, I came out here in 1969 with Control Data Corporation uh -huh. uh, from Minneapolis, and um, so I and I'm retired now, but I've had many years of watching this unfold. And I think that the satisfaction of dealing with ones and zeros, with mathematic with logic, uh, with uh, multiple choice and true false is so much simpler than dealing with the fuzziness of social interactions. And um, I think it's easy to overlook the fact that women are just as intelligent as men. Women are actually more likely to network and, and uh, extend their intelligence beyond individuals um, among themselves. And I think that it's the ease with which someone can become obsessed with, with uh, definite concrete answers uh, rather than the social fuzziness of the emotional life and, and interactions with other people, maybe the reason why so many people are now almost militantly saying, let's exclude women, let's start a club that's men only, uh, which was in the paper a few weeks ago. Um, they're missing out on, on an entire world as well as the fact that uh, 
all you need is a few refrigerators and women and you can keep the human race going. So men are almost obsolete anyway. Um, why are we fleeing to ones and zeros and easy answers? I think that that's where a lot of the exclusion comes from because computers programming are all dealing with true and false and errors and getting things right and having it be very simple to understand. I think some of it um, definitely has to do with who's running the companies. I mean, I think this is a little bit of a circular question. I mean, I realize I raised it. Um, but <laughs> nonetheless, um, I do think when you have more women in charge, then um, some of these issues will cease you know, to be part of the way that, that people think about um, these matters. And it's for me, they're two of the people, two of the seven people I write about in um, my book are women. And um, what's interesting is to see the ways in which it was easier and the ways in which it was harder back then. I mean, it was harder because there were almost no women in the industry at all. In some bizarre way, it was easier because the sexism was so rampant that you could have um, one of the women I write about is a woman named Sandy Kurtzig, who's the first woman to take a tech company public. And it was a software company. And she told people she sold software and they thought she sold lingerie. Uh. And that was just, you know, par for the course. People asked her to bring coffee. People thought she was a booth babe. And that was just sort of considered normal. Um, so she uh, and, and the other woman I write about uh, is a woman named Fawn Alvarez who worked on the factory line. Um, it, things were rarely seen um, in, in terms of sexism or not sexism because that's just the way the world was. So it's, it's a very complicated story to tell looking back and trying to untangle it now I think has been, I mean we know it's not unique to the tech industry unfortunately we keep getting abundant evidence of that. How are we doing on time? Uh, we have time for two more questions. Okay. Hi. Uh, well, first of all, I wanted to uh, first thank, especially Mitch, for uh, creating Noisebridge. Uh, and as, as an immigrant who came here with pretty much nothing and just a dream, I always found Noisebridge to be an amazing safe space for somebody who, you know, if you don't know anyone, you don't have any money, you don't have PC money. It's a very safe space where you can just go, express yourself, learn a lot, and uh, and you know, and it's always open for everyone. So I, I want to first thank you, and I know a few other people in the audience who, us immigrants, still found like it was an amazing place to, to land in the city. Yeah, and uh, and then the question is, uh, in terms of like you know that con that connection of the counterculture with uh, Silicon Valley, what do you think today or in the future? What are the countercultural movements? there are shifting you know, the new products and the new ideas that get developed in the Valley. And in particular, like if I think about it, I can only think of maybe Burning Man, which is the one that you know, inspires a lot of people. And to me, the notion that it has to happen somewhere really far away in the desert where you don't bother anyone, I don't know if that's an indicator of how the culture is being shifted in the Valley. And I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. I don't know. Um, San Francisco has just become such an amazingly expensive place, as you, you point out in, in your book. Uh, and um, can Silicon Valley continue to persist um, in the face of this if the, if the people who work at Google and the other high paying tech jobs feel that they're barely being able to survive with, uh, the cost of living in San Francisco it's not really a place where um, the weirdos of the country and the world can collect uh, the very wealthy ones and the ones with jobs lined up, perhaps. Um, so that is um, not boding too well right now. Of course, when the tech bubble bursts, maybe things will start to uh, attract more interesting weird people again. And we are in a bubble, so it will burst. Um, and this has uh, a lot of momentum from its history, so I think it will persist. Um, but yeah, um, uh, we've proven to be really bad as a species in predicting the future. Um, but we are really good in creating the future by the choices we make in the present. So.
so uh, I encourage you and everyone here to uh, make the cool choices. <laughs> and who will be our last question? Okay, so I'm deep on the crypto hype. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not for the money, for the revolution. <laughs> and I, and I, you know, so I, I believe really in the revolutionary aspects of the decentralization of money and what blockchain can do to give power back to us to be in control of our information. Um, but I'm wondering why at the conferences you're going to, they immediately veto blockchain stuff. I had the same question. <laughs> oh, just because there's so much hype. Um, and there's been so many talks where people uh, say things about how cool they are without explaining how. So um, it's not that uh, people believe blockchain isn't useful. It's just that there's been just so much hype about it and therefore there's way more talks about it than um, our people who have something to add. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, uh, but let me ask you, what do you see uh, as, like for you yourself, what would you like to see blockchain being used for to help what you call the revolution? Well, the, the, Grab the, uh, mic. the, the ISPs question, or the, uh, the decentralized internet question, um, I went to Learners Guild in Oakland, and, which they mentioned the Omni meetup, um, and it was a mesh network uh, workshop about how to create something to, to broadcast an internet signal all around our neighborhood to our neighbors, and then use Ethereum to have smart contracts, which you pay into the digital smart contract before you make the transaction, and then you sign the contract digitally, both parties afterwards, and then it distributes the money so that you can pay for the internet, but in small amounts, and it's all done you know, instantly and quickly, no, <laughs> instantly and quickly, quickly through Ethereum, and there's, uh, there's another, um, there's another crypto token called Substratum that's trying to do the same thing to build a larger idea of a decentralized ISP um, platform and many, many other things that I'm super interested in and that are just endlessly fascinating. And it feels like what the internet started as, as a decentralized democracy of information and what it's done for for the freedom of information and the sharing of information uh, through through technology to the, all the humans all around the world and what that's done to revolutionize the world it feels like we're you know the money took that over in a big way and the deep underlying philosophy of blockchain and why crypto is invented is a response to what's happened and is the new, the new um, evolution of the internet to take back the internet in for, for all of humankind. <laughs> and I'd also actually point out that um, we're hearing a whole lot about Oakland in this conversation tonight, which makes me wonder if the answer to the, do we have to go to Burning Man um, might be, Go to Oakland. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you might mention uh, Pseudo Room's doing another mesh workshop on the 27th this month, 2 p.m. Okay. Yeah, so uh, on the 27th of this month at 2 p.m. at Pseudo Room was, uh, just to put it on the record, uh, another meetup for the mesh network if anyone's interested. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks yeah, everyone. It's been super.